I told the earlier service, service, I said, sometimes the, the, the people that God uses to usher in the anointing don't always look like we think they need to look like. They may not be the, 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 the age that we think they ought to be, but this group brought it this morning. They brought it, and they allowed us to be able to bask in it, and it makes it so easy just to jump on in and move it to the next level, all right? <laughs> So I get the privilege this morning of talking about the shepherd. And before I do, I want to kind of, kind of go back and recap a little bit and discuss what I think might be a little confusion. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. You see, the gifts of the Spirit are the manifestation of the Spirit for the profit of all. These are gifts of the Spirit, one Spirit being the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, these gifts are manifested in those that are filled with the Spirit, those that have been uh, brought into the kingdom. They are, they are gifts that are out here in the body. But the gifts that we speak of this morning, talking about the gifts of Christ, where he said, I gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists. The gift is the individual. That's the Christ gift to the church. And I have to ask myself, why is it that Christ decided to give these gifts in, in a separation of five? What, what was his purpose? And when I really get down to the nitty-gritty, what I think, and I may be wrong, because I am wrong sometimes, but what I think is because if he gave it all into one person, they'd be so puffed up, they wouldn't be able to be used. You see, Paul said, there's a messenger of Satan that buffets me, a thorn in my flesh, that I've gone to the Lord three times. This is a man that, that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He knew mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He was so far beyond most of what we have experienced in our lifetime. Yet, he was able to keep himself humble. The Bible says you pray for wisdom, but you put on humility. So what was it, why was it that, they, that a man that could raise, that could be used to raise people from the dead could not deliver himself from whatever that thorn was? And we get caught up in all the theologians on what the thorn was. But you're missing the point. It's why the thorn was there. The thorn was there to keep him humble. He said knowledge puffs up. So I believe that God has created these gifts and he, he tells you in Ephesians... He said, what is the purpose? It's to, it's to uh, for the unity of the faith, for the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, which is Christ, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, if you could walk with me, the objective is for all of us to grow up and be Christ-like. Do we agree? That's what a Christian is, is to be Christ-like. So the objective is for these gifts that God has poured out on individuals that have filled the call to the ministry. And let me share a little bit about the term ministry. We get a little caught up and we think ministry, we, we think ministry means rock star. But the Bible speaks of a ministry that means servant. Jesus said, I didn't come to, to, to be served, I came to, be, to serve. My objective was to come and pour my, my uh, uh, life into these men so that they could pour their lives into other men and women and we can build an army for the kingdom of God. That's the overall purpose of what God wants to do. So get the rock star mentality out and start recognizing those that operate in a gift as a servant of the Most High. Now, some of that doesn't mean people that are necessarily... On stage, some of you have been called out to be a servant of the Most High. You have a five-fold ministry calling in your life, and you feel it. And you're learning, just like I am, how to walk in that ministry. And there are age groups of that ministry. And I don't mean age group in the natural. I mean age group in the spiritual. 
So as we transition as a church, you, you've watched our church transition, and we're transitioning for the millennials to start coming and taking their place. Now, we as older generation, we can look at that in two different ways. We can wonder, where's my place? Or we can recognize that God sees that he's bringing up a new generation. Our children are starting to find their place. They're starting to step into their calling. And those of us that have been in this man's war for a while, we're there to lift them up, to put them on our shoulder, and to take them to a place that, they, that, that we all know we want to go. You see, I use Moses as an example. Moses was a mighty man of God that did great exploits for the kingdom of God. He led a people through the wilderness for 40 years. Moses got, and God said, strike the rock and allow the water to come from the rock. But when God came back and said, strike, speak to the rock, Moses struck the rock. You know why Moses struck the rock? Because he struck it before, and that's the way it was before. So he automatically thought, that's the way I've got to do it again. We've got to be a nomadic people. We've got to be a people that are willing to pull up our tent stakes and move with the cloud. That means we've got to be able to realize that this, because God did it this way in the past doesn't mean God's doing it this way in the future. We've got to allow this younger generation to rise up on our shoulders and begin to do the things that they do. And guess what? They're going to stumble. They're going to fall. And it's our job to pick them up and lift them up and give them what they need to go on. I have two young adults in this room that are my children. And there's no greater joy that I have for my life to see my children find their gifting and calling and begin to walk in it. And that's my desire for everyone in this house, no matter what your age is. All of our objective is to grow up in the things of God. And these ministries are to mature the body. That's the purpose of the ministry. Not tied up into one individual, but tied up into multiple individuals, recognizing the gift and calling on all of them. So, let's get to my message. <laughs> this morning, I recap a little bit where Jeremy kicks us off and he talks about the governing abilities of an apostle. So, someone who operates in that gift, I used this example in the first service. Many of you have been to Fully Alive. How many have been to Fully Alive? Okay, great. So what that means is you probably took a personality test. You probably were a gold or a silver or a blue or a purple. I don't remember the colors. But you took a personality pr test that kind of gave them an idea of what your, your, your direction is or where your giftings are, if you will. In my day, we, we called it melancholy, phlegmatic, uh, choleric, we had these different types of words, but it was the same thing. Maybe you did the DISC system, where you're a high D, or you're an I, or you're an S. All of those trying to define the personality that you walk in. Well, Jesus gave these gifts unto men are, are like personalities. These different people walk in these, these callings, if you will, and they begin to learn how to be led by the Spirit the Bible says that those that are led by the Spirit are the sons and daughters of God. So as you walk out your calling, making your stumbling, getting up, doing what you're supposed to do, you're trying to find the Spirit every time you're doing it. Because it's the Spirit that gives life. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us direction. And I know some of you have been in a situation where you've said, why are we moving toward this spiritual thing? This is all, we're getting toward Pentecostalism, we're getting toward Charismaticism. And, and that's a struggle for you because you might have been raised differently. But you see, there's, there can be too much spirit where we're so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. And there could be too much word where all we do is try to cross the dies and dot the T's. And like David said last week, he said it's a dead letter without the spirit. The objective is to be able to follow right in the middle and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us to the head, which is Christ. That's his desire. To grow us up in the body that we become no, not just sons and daughters, but we become mothers and fathers. There are mothers and fathers in this house. And you have a lot to offer this younger generation as they begin to find their place. And we can either be jealous of what God's doing in their life or we can be a part of what God's doing in their life. I don't know about you, but I want to see my children excel. 
I want to see them, and when I see them excel, I'm excited just as if it's me myself. Matter of fact, it's even greater if I see them than my own self. That's what a mother and father does, and that's what we do in the house of God. Jeremy explained that that apostolic anointing is a, is a governing anointing. It's an anointing that, that, that creates an atmosphere for the Lord, but it's not focused on seeker-friendly things. You see, Joey, who is more evangelical, is going to be more seeker-friendly. He's going to be going out there pulling you, making it comfortable for you. But that's his gifting. Kendra talked about the prophet. The prophet is someone that is able to, to give guidance, to be able to help you see around the corner. There are things that are coming to, that keep kind of the watchman on the wall, if you will. But you know that you could have a gift of a prophet and be out of God's will. There are a lot of people that will move outside of the Spirit and not be guided by the Holy Spirit in the gift of prophecy, and they can be out of God's will. You can begin to prophesy all kinds of things over people, but not be in God's will. So you have to be checked by the Spirit. You have to be led by the Spirit. You have to be the one that allows the encouragement and the edification to come through what God's called you in that realm that you call the prophetic realm. But we get, all, we, we, we get kind of messed up because a lot of times we'll go off on our own and we won't allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. And without the Spirit, it's a dead letter, and it kills. David. I'll use David as an example. Last weekend, he did an absolute phenomenal job. This young man is 22 years old. Okay, I can look upon David, and I could say, before I ever know his pedigree, that this young man has had fathers in his life. He's had mothers in his life that poured into him. He's got a foundation that somebody laid. And I began to think about this young man and how he could bring forth the teaching gift that God's called him into. But there's two things I can do. I can shun him away because he's too young and not be able to receive from him. Or I can be able to help him along his path, learning to be led by the Spirit. And then he can edify the body and all of us can grow up together. That's the purpose. That's what God's trying to create in this room. We can sit in here, and I worry just as much as you do about the, 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 the chairs that are not filled. I had a dream this week where I, I could see the faces of people that were once in these chairs. And my heart is heavy for those people. But I know that God has something great on this house. And his desire is to raise up a people that will not be, uh, to, to, to be swayed by every wind of doctrine. And their desire will be to hear the Spirit of God and be led by the Spirit. And begin to not get caught up on who's preaching and who's not preaching. But begin to follow the Spirit where he leads and follow the shepherd. Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice and no other voice will they follow. They are led. Do you realize that in this last time there will be many prof false prophets coming up saying things and saying Christ is over here and Christ is over there and God's warning us ahead of time. If you get your focus on the individual and take your focus off me, then you will be led astray. Listen to my voice, people of God. My desire is to lead you and grow you up because I need a church in this last hour to stand up and be the warrior king to be able to usher my presence in. And the only way he's going to get that church is if we get out of our mode of being able to be receivers and get in our mode to be givers. When I walk into this house, I don't say, God, what have you got for me today? I say, God, what can I do for you today? That's a mature believer. That's a believer that comes in here and says, God, you've gifted me, and I thank you for that gift. Now, how can I pour that gift into somebody else? That's my desire. That's not my message, but I thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> Why are we teaching this? That may be a question for you. First of all, it's biblical. The five-fold ministry the whole five-fold ministry, if you begin to study it, you will find parts of each gifting throughout the whole Bible. 
from the old to the new. And you'll see where God has started in it in the old, and he reveals it in the new. And that's what Paul's doing. This is a Gentile church he's talking to in Ephesians. This is a church without a God. That's what Gentile means. So he's talking to this Gentile church that used to be serving all kinds of gods. And he's trying to help them see a bigger picture. A picture that's not made up of the results that we think are considered to be God's will. We automatically assume that if we fill every seat in this room, we must be doing God's will. Do you know there are thousands of churches that have every seat filled, and they may not be the church of the end time? Do you understand that? I'm not against any other church. I believe in all the ch local churches, and I believe God's doing great. But there is a system out there that are gonna, we're going to be caught up. The biggest battle that Christ de dealt with when he came back was the religious system. He dealt with it in the, in the priesthood that was taken from the law of Moses. He dealt with the, the Sadducee and the Pharisee. And he gave us an avenue. He said, I'm going to break the bondage. I'm going to fulfill the entire law. And then I'm going to open up the access way to the Shekinah glory of God. How did he do that? The Bible said when he died, the veil of the temple was ripped. He was the gate that let us in. He was the sacrifice in the, in, out, on the outer courts. And he is the glory that's inside the temple. And he gave us access to move in there. So his purpose was for us to have, to, for him to be our high priest. But what do we do? We tend to put people in the way. We tend to go back to our Western religion ideas and we tend to gravitate toward individuals thinking that they're going to give me access into God. I'm telling you as a shepherd in this house, I can't give you access to the kingdom of God. I, all I can do is give you the vision of it, and then only Jesus can take you in. He is the only high priest. I can operate under a priestly anointing, but I'll never be the priest of Jesus Christ in your life. He is your only a high priest, and my job is to be in tune with the Spirit because the Spirit, the Bible says the Spirit's always talking about the Father. He's always giving glory to the Father. He knows no other thing to do because He is one with the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Holy Spirit says, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus because I am the one that's pointing you there. That's why it's important that we do allow the things of the Spirit to come in because if we don't, we're not allowed to see what the Father's doing. We're all law. All we can do is gain knowledge. That's it. Knowledge puffs up, Paul says, but the Spirit brings life. So if we can learn to gather the, the Holy Spirit and begin to, to, to receive the knowledge of the Spirit, it says the Holy Spirit leads and guides you into all truth. You can't see truth without the Spirit. He said no man can say that, that, that Jesus Christ is, is, is the Son of God unless it be by the Spirit. There's a, there's a revelation that takes place that only the Spirit can make happen in your life. Number two, it supports a healthy relationship between those in leadership and those who lead. What's that mean? That means there's no one in between you and the presence of the Lord. Just you and the Lord enter in. I'm just a, a, a shepherd that allows... To, you to, to, uh, to create an environment for the Spirit to come in. That's our job. Every shepherd in their, this house is to create us an environment to allow the Holy Spirit to come in. Because you know, if the Holy Spirit doesn't come in, we're just having church. We're not gaining anything out of this. But if we can allow the Holy Spirit to come into this room, and, and, and you, what I mean by allow, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. So we can grieve the Spirit. We can get on our own agendas and our own thoughts and be able to, 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 to build up our own ideas and our own ideologies. And we can do all that and grieve the Spirit. And the Spirit will stay outside and we'll still have church in here. But I don't want to have church. I want to have church. I want to be able to let the Spirit lead us. And all of us operate in our giftings, in our lane, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And if we're all doing the same thing, being led by the Spirit, guess what happens? Then God begins to grow us up in the things of God, and we mature as an army. And then we can be that beacon. 
I believe with all my heart that New River Fellowship is a beacon for this community. Quite frankly, it could be a beacon for the world. God, this church has gone through so much. I've been here almost 10 years, and I've watched it go through some tough times. But it still stands. There's still something here. The presence of God is still here. And if we could figure out what it is that we've got to do in order to connect to that, then guess what happens? God's going to come in here like a flood, and he's going to do something great and something powerful. But we're not going to do that by getting in your way. We're going to do that by encouraging you to grow up in the things of the faith. Amen? Amen. Number four, it provides all the giftings of Christ, not just a few. He says in Ephesians 4, he says, to the measure of the fullness of Christ. How many understand that the word Christ or Christian means Christ-like? So our overall goal is to become him. Okay, we're, we're to become Christ-like. That's the goal. That means, we're, that, that means we're not going to become a God. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we walk in the fullness of Christ in our life. That means some of the things that we deal with, we put away. I believe in overcoming. Have I overcome all things? No. But my goal is to walk in a spirit of holiness. Not by works but a desire to walk, to put things aside, and to say, Father, I'm putting this aside because it's a distraction to the overall goal. Sin will always be a distraction to the overall goal. But if we can set sin aside on some areas in our life, then we can remove the distractions and allow God to do greater work in us. And that's the purpose. We rise up to become Christ-like. How many understand that Christ is the ultimate apostle? He is the ultimate prophet. He is the ultimate evangelist. He's the ultimate teacher. He's the ultimate shepherd. He's referred to all five, and he has made himself available in the gifts to the church in this fivefold ministry gifting. That doesn't mean these people are gods. Don't hear me wrong. These are people, fallen people that realize they need a Savior. They can't do it outside the Holy Spirit, outside of Christ. But the desire is to raise everybody up so that we become an army. Number five, it nurtures an environment for all to take part in the kingdom vision. It says in Ephesians 4 that every part does its share. It's why it talks about being a body. So you got my body here, as old as it is, and I'm... I can do without a hand, okay? But I can't do without a heart. Can't do without a liver. The Bible says that some of the hidden members of the body are some of the most important ones. Some of you out there that have been faithful for so long, coming in here, doing what it is you feel God's called you to do, God sees you. He's showing himself real to you. Don't think just because you don't have a spotlight that you're not important to this body. Matter of fact, you may be more important than those that do. Every member doing its part. All of us finding our lane so that we can begin to do something great for God. That's what he's trying to build. And that's the vision on this house. So back to being a pastor. I use... I use David. David's a great story because if you look in 1 Samuel 16, it talks about how David was anointed. You see, Samuel was just told it was obvious that the anointing had left Saul, and God said, quit mourning for Saul and go find the king that I'm looking for, which I've already chosen. Go find the king who's a son of Jesse. So Samuel goes straight to Jesse and says, bring out your number one son because that obviously has to be the king because he looks so kingly. So they brought out the oldest son. He comes out there, and here he is, and God said, that's not him. And it kind of messed Samuel up. Samuel goes, wait a minute. He said, Samuel, you're looking on the outside. I'm looking at the heart. So he goes through all of his sons, and then at the end he goes, do you have any left? He said, well, I I got this rooty little kid out there tending the sheep, David, but surely that's not him. So here comes David. And Saul knew by the instruction of the Lord that he was the one, and he anointed David as king. 
You see, David didn't look necessarily the way we thought. I'm proud of this worship group. I don't know about you, but if you've been here for very long, our worship has gone to a different level. And it's being led by a little young couple that's in their 20s. It may not look like what we think it should look like. But someone who's willing to move with the cloud that isn't tied down by their religion, that's allowing the Holy Spirit to lead them, could be more powerful than anybody that might be 50 or 60 or 70 years old tied up in their religious mindset. Don't get me wrong. I'm not discounting those that are fathers in the house. But as you transition in your life, you transition in your calling. Here's an example. Two young adults. Now, when I was younger, I made sure that, I, that Stacy and I, we disciplined, we did what was necessary to, to gain the respect of our children to help them understand that there's right and there's wrong. And when you do wrong, there's consequences. But I did that with a wooden spoon. Okay, spare the rod, spoil the child. My kids know the wooden spoon. I, I think we had a name for it. I don't remember. But at the end, right now, if I decide to use my wooden spoon on my son, he'd probably take it away from me. Because <laughs> he's gotten bigger than I am. He's stronger than I am. I've transitioned in my child rearing time. Stacy and I have. My wife's name's Stacy, so y'all have to keep up there. We're both Stacy's. But I've transitioned from being a parent to being a coach. Okay? So now I'm helping them figure their way into life and figure out what it is they need to do in order to get to that next level in life. I'm, I don't pull the wooden spoon out anymore. Okay, I can't parent them anymore. My parenting days are over. My coaching days have just begun. You understand that? It's no different in the body of Christ. There are fathers and mothers in this house that know what it means to raise a kid in the things of God. And you fathers and mothers are encouraging this next generation to move into their location and move into their place. And some of them are your kids. And that's what God intended. When Joshua took over, that generation of Moses either accepted him and encouraged him or they died in the wilderness. There were very few that went over to the promised land because they could not get out of their religious thing mindset. This is the way we've done it all these years. I strike the rock, water comes. I strike it again, water comes. But God's saying, I'm doing something new. So you need to move with the cloud. So that's exactly what we want to do. If we want to move to our promised line, land, we're going to see generation after generation. And if each generation stands on the shoulders of those before them, then we will build a mighty army for God. But when we make them have to learn by themselves, then we're not helping them whatsoever. Ever. I don't want to throw my kids out into the wilderness and not be able to share some of the wisdom that I have in their life. You see, I, believe it or not, I'm actually getting smarter in my kids' mind as the years get over, as the years go. They're in their 20s, and all of a sudden, mom and dad aren't as stupid as they used to be back in their teens. How many have experienced that? You see, we, we get smarter in our old age, at least according to our children. But what it is, is they begin to value true wisdom, and then they see the character in your life, because I'm telling you, your, your words say one thing, but your actions say something else. So if there's character in your life, then your children will begin to see that, and then all of a sudden, they value your opinion. And they began to pull on that. It happens in the kingdom of God as well. As we have these young babies become fresh in the kingdom, their job is to be able to relate with one of you that are out here. Not necessarily those that, are, that have come on the platform. It could be you that's pouring into them to help them get to that next level. Each one of us doing their part. So back to the shepherd. David was the perfect shepherd for this, and he started out in Psalms 23, and I'm going to read it. Let me get my spectacles out here. 
This Bible's word, the words on my Bible get a lot smaller every year. He says, you've heard this psalm many a times. Most of you have it memorized, but it's a great psalm, and we're going to break it down and talk about the characteristics of a shepherd. Number one, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, they have walked the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Number one, a shepherd prepares a place for rest and provides food to eat. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Notice that it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. I don't know if you've ever raised sheep, but sheep wander. It's hard to keep them together. They wander off. They don't always do what the shepherd wants them to do. And sometimes the shepherd has to make them do it. And there's times where the shepherd needs to make the people be able to lie down in the green pastures and rest and receive good nourishment. And a shepherd... That's what he's trying to do. He, he's trying to prepare a place in here for rest and provide food to eat. If you haven't listened to the messages, all of the five messages, including this one, if you haven't listened to the other four, you need to go back and listen to them because they've been good messages. These young men and women have done a great job of explaining these gifts. And it may not be packaged in the package we're accustomed to, but if we can get past the package and look at the heart, we can hear what the voice is saying. It's funny because it's the same scripture that talks about in Ephesus, the church of Ephesus in Revelation. He says, in all the churches, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. That's his way of saying, listen. Listen. If it means you have to shut your eyes because you're focused on the person as opposed to what he's bringing, then that means you have to shut your eyes and listen. Because God's trying to say something. He's trying to let you be able to see what he's doing in this hour. Number two, a shepherd makes room for the Holy Spirit. He leads me beside still waters. Water is a type of the Holy Spirit. I said before, we can't be all spiritually minded that we're no earthly good. And we can't be all the word where it's a dead letter and it's not able to do anything without the power of the Spirit. We have to find that happy medium to be able to be led by the Spirit. For those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. He says in John 4, 23, he says, But the hour is come, and now is, when the true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. He's trying to build a church that is in tune. My People know my voice and no other voice will they follow. They're listening for me. You see, I'm reminded by the Shulamite that's in the Songs of Solomon. We go back to the Songs of Solomon and that little girl, the Shulamite, she runs into the streets and she says, Have you seen my beloved? Do you know where he's at? She's asking everybody where her beloved is. That's a type of the bride seeking for her bridegroom. He's looking for a people that is seeking for him, that preparing themselves, making themselves ready, putting on their wedding garments and being able to make themselves ready so the bridegroom can come and receive them. That's what he's trying to do, and he has to do that through a maturing stage so that we can be able to learn how to listen to the Spirit. Hear that hears, he that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. That's his desire. He's looking for a people not caught up in all the stuff that goes around, but a people that continue, keep their eyes focused on Him. A shepherd makes room for the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? We create an atmosphere for the let, allow the Holy Spirit to move. We bring in worship and allow these worshipers to learn how to use their giftings to be able to draw the Spirit in. And then we allow the ones that teach to learn how to teach in that channel. I can get up here and give you great, eloquent speech. Actually, I can't. 
because that's just not who I am. But I can, I, if I could, I could come up here and be the most wonderful orator that there ever was. But if there's no Holy Spirit guiding in that, then I'm just a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. There's nothing, there's nothing that I'm giving you has any value. But if I can tap into his anointing and be able to draw on him, then all of a sudden the words that come out of me have life and they begin to pour into your spirit and your spirit begins to rise up with those words. Number three, a shepherd comforts those in need. I believe it was Joey that read Isaiah 61 a couple weeks ago. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and open the prison door to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of God and to comfort all who mourn, to console those that mourn in Zion. How does a shepherd do that? He prays for you. You come into this house, we're always providing opportunity for prayer. Even if there's no one down here in front, you can always grab somebody in this house to pray. Because we know the battles that we all go through. And sometimes where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. You need somebody to come in agreement with you. You need somebody to be able to say, you know what? I don't exactly understand everything you're going through, but I'm empathetic and I want to know that I, that I love you and I want something for you. I want God to bring you out of that situation if that's his will. You understand that? Our desire is to serve. If our desire is not to serve, then we're not a minister. Our desire is to serve. I, I'm not paid by this church. I say that because I want you to know my heart. My desire, I, in February of this year, I, I took a rest because of all the stuff that we've gone through. I'd been in it for seven years, and I desired to just pull out. And the Lord told me, he said, you need to set out for a season. And I set out, but my heart kept coming back. My heart kept drawing back because I love you. And my desire is to see a people rise up that's so much greater than what this world is calling church. I want to see God move in such a mighty way that he raises up an army that when those last days, when those that are, could be deceived will be deceived, there will be a garner that they could run into. The wheat and the chaff are raising up together, but there is going to be a separation and they're going to need somewhere to hold all that wheat. We're going to have to have a place, a refuge, if you you will, a strong tower, something to run into so that the presence of God is still alive here on earth in this latter day. That's what we want to build here. Not an Ephesus unto an individual, but an Ephesus unto Christ and Christ alone. Number four, a shepherd leads by example. We understand that there are criteria that God puts on those who teach. He said, don't, don't necessarily ask to be a teacher because I require something of you. He told Timothy, he said, walk worthy of your calling. I realize, and this is what's going to happen. I, I, what could happen? I'm not going to speak. It does. It's going to happen. But if I walk out a step, God will set me down. Do you understand that? We feel like that we've got to create every situation and fix everything for God. But God has a way of now setting us down. Now, he may use men, and he often does. He uses men and, and, uh, that he's, that's trustworthy, men and women, to, to, to call out some of these things. But God will correct who he needs to correct. And there's a, a, a lifestyle that you have to live. He says you have to be sober-minded. You have to be hospitable, of good behavior. You have to be a, a husband of one wife. I've been married for 25 years coming next year. You see, I'm not saying that, that uh, I'm not up here trying to puff myself up and tell you that I've got all these qualifications. I'm working them out as well. But my point in all that is there are qualifications for those that desire to walk into ministry. So if that's a call of God in your life, you need to understand that. There are going to be some things in your life that you might be lawful but may not be prudent. There may be things in your life that God says, you know what, I want you to get rid of that even though it may not be sin. There's a requirement if you're going to walk in a calling of God, you've got to walk worthy of your call. 
Amen? Number five, a shepherd protects his sheep. Yea, they I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. This is Jesus. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he will not, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not his own, it might help if I put my glasses on. One who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is the hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. A shepherd protects his sheep. How does he do that? Sometimes he has to do the hard things. I want you to pay attention to those that are in this ministry now, the shift that we've had. You'll see a lot of familiar faces. I'm going to show you some at the end of this message. But their desire is to protect the sheep. My heart is to protect the sheep of God. I don't want to raise my hands and have blood stains on my hands. I want to be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with the little, I'll make you ruler over much. I want God to begin to say and kiss me on the forehead. But I've got to be able to do what he told me to do. I can't strike the rock just because the rock happened last time to bring forth water when I struck it. i got to be able to speak to it when he tells me to. And oftentimes that means doing the hard things. Making the hard decisions. But it's our desire. And guess what? We make mistakes. And I apologize for the mistakes that I've made. But my heart is for you. My heart is to see you go to the fullness of the knowledge of Christ. To to, to grow up in the measure of the fullness of Christ. That is my heart. Number six. A shepherd brings correction and a direction. Proverbs 3.11 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Sometimes there's a rod and a staff. I told you my son and my daughter know about the rod, but they also know about the staff. And a good shepherd will come in and sometimes use the rod. And you may feel like I'm doing that this morning. Please don't feel that. My desire is to bless you. My desire is to, to, to pour in you and learn my gift as well as I begin to operate in that gift. Number seven, a shepherd treats you as a son and daughter. Romans eight fourteen says, For many are led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. How does he do that? He doesn't want to show any partiality. He wants to be able to love on all in the same manner. Then lastly, number eight, a shepherd anoints his sheep. You anoint my head with oil, David said. James 4 says, I'm ashamed, James 5, 14 says, Is any among sick, sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. I told you before that the anointing is actually a shepherd term. You see, the anointing, is where the sheep get covered with anointing oil all over their head. I don't know if you've ever raised animals, but they're they're nasty. Heel flies can create grubs on the backs of, of cattle, and you have to pick the grub out. These insects burrow into the head and the ears and the eyes and the nose of the sheep, and the anointing oil is what protects them. And then the sheep goes and he anoints his fellow sheep as he rubs his head upon them. And then that anointing starts from a few sheep and then it goes to the whole flock. That's exactly what a shepherd wants to create. He wants to provide the anointing. If I could set the atmosphere so that the anointing can flow and anoint the sheep, then all those idle words and those things that come in from the outside, those, that backbiting and that, that, that the gossiping that takes place won't burrow in your head and you'll begin to listen and to be able to hear the voice of the shepherd. And that's what God's desire is. 
His desire is to anoint your head so that you will anoint someone else. And then that someone else will be anointed. And then so on and so forth. So the whole body begins to fit together, working together for the common good so that all the whole place can be anointed. And then those that are lost out there will feel it. They'll, they'll know that it's, there's something in this house that's different. There's something that's drawing them in. I look around and I realize that there are empty seats and my heart goes out to those that I don't see fill those seats. But what I know is if we could create something that God is doing in here and allow Him to be the head, then what's going to happen? He said in the last days, it's like the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, they were marrying and giving in marriage. And they came and the flood came, but the people of Noah knew what was coming. And they prepared and then what they did was they opened up their doors when it was brought before the flood. They didn't go out and get the animals and draw them in. The Spirit of God drew them in. You see, the body of Christ is like the ark. There's a flood coming, people. I don't say that to give you fear. I say that to give you joy. Because when the flood comes, the healer comes. And that's what we want. So we want to prepare a place where all to come in. I'm going to ask the elders and the, the uh, deacons to come up with their wives, please. And Joey, where's Joey and, and David? Y'all come up too, and your wives too, if you have them there handy. I want you to notice some familiar faces. These are people that have been tested. They're not perfect, but they've been tested. They've been vetted. They've been poured into. They're still learning their gifts just like we are. They're going to stumble just like I do. Everybody else, we're all going to be working together, learning how to follow the things of the Spirit. But let me tell you, you are not lacking a shepherd in this house because you have many. Do you understand that? They're all up here. These are a part of the shepherds of this house and they have the same heart desire that I'm sharing with you this morning to pour into you, to love you. Somebody that's standing up here, you're connected to. There's a connection that takes place. Don't feel like it's only the person who speaks is the only one you can connect to. Realize that there are a host of people up here wanting to serve, equipped, sober-minded, husbands of one wife. They are a mighty God-fearing people that desire to pour into your life. Life. Amen. This group is going to become bigger. We're in the process of developing other deacons in this house so that you're going to see a group of people. Some of those are going to be you. God's going to call you out. There are people in this room right now that God's calling to the next step. Jennifer. You've been on my heart since I sat over there. I don't know what it is God's been telling you, but He's calling you to another step. I'm calling you out in it, young lady. You've got a pedigree in your life. God has had people pour into your heart. He's had people pour into you. There's a ministering spirit in your life. And God wants to equip that and grow it up in you. I want you to receive that. Troy, There's a spirit on you that God wants to take and ignite like he never has before. There's, I don't know what's been going on in the last few years in your life, but there's been some battles in your life. And God wants to take and tell you that he is the one that fights your battles. He is the one that's going to set you free. He is the one that's going to lift you up and give you what it is that he needs, that you need. There is a powerful anointing in here. And my desire is for us to be able to all take part in this anointing. As two or three gather and they begin to get anointed, each one will begin to get anointed if we operate as a family. These are mothers and fathers. You are mothers and fathers in this house. Let's, let's move that transition and begin to, to go from parenting to coaches and allow us to coach our way into the kingdom. Amen? I'm going to ask my bride to end us in prayer. Thank you. Um, the word of God is 
um, manna. It's our food for us, right? I pray that um, you were fed today. Um, I hope and pray that, that something you can take today that sustains you for the rest of the week, okay? But we also pray that you don't wait till next Sunday before you've fed your spirit um, with good things, right? Um, so we want to thank all of you today. Um, if anybody was new, we thank you as well um, for being here and joining us. And um, let's just pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, um, just for your word. Um, I pray, Lord, uh, that you would be with each and everybody, everybody here today. Um, Father, I pray blessings and favor over everybody this next week. And I ask that you be with them. Reveal yourself to them in each and every way that you know how to speak to us, Father. I know that you know how to do that. So, Father, I thank you do that in the sweetest of ways. And we ask you to be with them in Jesus' name.